limitations. We should start, as any sensible organisation, with a strategy with the integrated business plan for 2018-19. Ian, you've spoken about this before, you've taken on board people's comments. Is there anything more you want to add? So it is important that this organisation adopts the business plan for the forthcoming operating year. Is there any, are there any further questions people would like to ask about the business plan? Can I propose it then for adoption? Has everyone agreed? Thank you very much indeed. Having adopted the, bud, uh, the business plan, it's then important that we adopt the budget for 2018-19. This has similarly previously come to this shadow board and been discussed and developed. Again, Ian, is there anything you would like to add on the budget? So we have a proposal to spend 80.03 million in the 2018-19 year, as broken down in the paper. Any questions for Ian or comments or observations on the proposed budget? Thank you. Can I have your support then for the budget? So the bud yes, thank you very much. The budget is therefore set for the forthcoming year. Now one or two just very important technical matters to keep us on the right side of the lines. So item nine is approval of continuation operations and transacting arrangements. Ian, I think you might want just to comment on this. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. As I think everybody's aware, the arrangements that we've operated under to date have involved a commissioning board, and it was the arrangements which were set out in the principal document group of the department. Um, and all our procurement and transacting employing has been done by partner bodies, um, principally the big combined authorities and TFGM. What this paper aims or will allow us to do is not is, is to carry on with those arrangements. So anything that we have commissioned or procured um, in the period before we were a statutory body will simply be rolled over um, and we'll continue to um, operate under those contracts. It saves us from having to go out and recommission and reprocure everything that we're doing uh, as it sets out in the paper. It would um, it would be a, cause severe difficulties if we were to need to reprocure everything that we've contracted to date. Um, the second point is simply one um, that sets out the arrangements for transferring the money that currently exists in TFN on TFN's account, which is held by Great Manchester Combined Authority as the um, accountable body, um, but needs to be transferred to Transport for them. That all makes good sense to me. Any questions for Ian on the conduct of arrangements? Yes, Julie. Can I, uh, just, just bring the mic to you. Make it easy. Thank you very much. Um, at Sheffield City Region is one of those bodies that have been carrying out contracting and procurement contracts, etc. Does that mean then that no further new contracts are commissioning? Uh, or in effect, would you be expecting partners to continue with any new further procurement and contracts? It does have an implication on our. Uh, resourcing. No, no, we'll be um, we'll be contracting on our own behalf. Uh, there are some we have had discussions with with partner officers yeah. about novating contracts. There are certain yeah. contracts that lack the final. Idea to those. Yeah. However, it's just that if there are expectations of partners to carry out any new contract procurement, we'll, we'll, be, contract, <laughs> we'll, be, we'll so be transacting on our own what, behalf. That's what I needed to hear. Thank you. Fit by the end of the meeting. Um, thank you for that. And of a similar order, as a statutory body, we have to adopt a treasury management arrangement. Ian, do you want to say anything more about this? Uh, I think there's probably only a couple of things. I think most people will be used to this kind of document. Um, it, it's brought out in the exact summary. There are just a couple of things that we've, we've talked about before in terms of TFN's arrangements. One is that we're unable to borrow, including overdrafts. And secondly, that we are for all practical purposes, unable to raise revenue, and therefore this treasury management strategy is, is written to address those, or, or has to take account of those two key concerns, so it is probably slightly different in emphasis from, from some of the documents that you've seen in your own authorities. So it reflects our legal position.
Good afternoon. Ian, we, uh, we raised this question at the last meeting, the reserve strategy of £2 million. Pounds. The only concern I have with this is that we, we have limited revenues, and obviously if we lock £2 million pounds away straight away, which we're not using as working capital, because we're not able, one, we're not able to have an overdraft, and you say that the £2 million pounds has to be maintained, it's for emergencies. I think we really could do with a better understanding of what sort of emergencies we might actually need the £2 million pounds for, um, in terms of the liabilities of TFM. That would make it more transparent. Okay. Um, I think there are a number of there are a number of things. I think we, we at the moment the planned expenditures are around um, eighty million. Um, in some months, there's going to be maybe eight nine million pounds going out of TFN. So the reserve that we have in terms of the cash that will be flowing is actually in the order of a week. Um, we have had issues um, and these are, this is not these are administrative as much as anything in terms of um, cash flows coming from the department all our fund all our funding comes with conditions it's it's ring fenced um, there are operational difficulties that we, we face that we can't simply fall back on a on a, a, a loan draft to deal with those cash those cash flow in issues um, we're also required under under SIPFA code to um, maintain a reserves policy for Issues that might arise, given the scale of the, the operations, um, given that we are we are new, we need to take into account the risk that we might face. Um, we've arrived at two million um, as the, as the number. We we can reassess that as we as we go on, um, but I think that as a proportion of our overall forecast expenditure for the year isn't isn't unreasonable. Building on what Andy said on an earlier item, I suggest this is something, Matthew, that we review and put a date in the diary to review, because you raise very legitimate points. We want taxpayers' money spent to the best effect. Um, so let's put this in. Perhaps, perhaps we should review this at the end of the financial year before we prepare the next budget. Is that acceptable? You're happy with that, Ian? Any further questions? Can I have your support, then, for the Treasury Management Arrangement? We have to have this in place. Thank you very much indeed. Well, again, Ian, on my behalf, thank you for all the work that you and your team have put into the development of the business plan and budget. Sets us up well to hit the ground running as a new body, which is what our um, constituents expect us to do. Thank you very much. I'm now moving then to item 11. During this very important period when we've been constitutionalising we have actually been out there working with our constituents and the public with many meetings across the country on the strategic draft transport plan. As a new body, we need to formally endorse the plan, which is an old body we endorsed, but that is important for the minutes. And I think it's also important we get an update as to how things have been going since the launch on the 16th of January. So I'm delighted to uh, welcome the strategy director, Jonathan Spruce. And Jonathan, could you give us that update? Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think just so, as the Chair said, there is a kind of a formal element to this, which as uh, the Partnership Board endorsed the transport plan, the draft transport plan for consultation in December, uh, you as a new statutory body are required to endorse that transport plan, the draft sustainability appraisal and the consultation process that goes with it, so that you can then move forward to the final transport plan as a statutory body in December, and it will come to that at the end. I also need to chair to form a record that Councillor Forbes from the North East Combined Authority has sent a letter in about this item uh, about moving forward to the final transport plan and how rail improvements, particularly on the East Coast Main Line, will be taken account of, which will be done through our strategic development corridor work. So that is formally recorded. But you asked me to give you a quick update, I think, on the, uh, on the consultation events. So myself and the team have been out uh, so the plan was formally launched on the 16th of January. The first of 33 consultation events was held in Preston on the 24th of January. Uh, the last one was held yesterday in London. Um, we braved the beast from the east, one, the mini beast from the east, and everything that the transport network could throw at us across the north of England. Um, over 600 people attended our events, and I'd just like to place on record my thanks to all the officers of the local authorities. We visited all 19 constituent authorities at least once. 
Uh, we didn't postpone any event due to weather, including one that uh, just about many in Blackburn, so I need to record my thanks to, to Blackburn with Darwin Council, making sure that went ahead as well. Um, we really enjoyed it. We got a very positive feedback. We've had over 5,000 separate downloads of the plan, which is about three times as many as we thought. Um, about 1,500 people who've downloaded the plan have since then clicked through to the, the online questionnaire. So when the consultation closes in about two or three weeks' time, we'll find out exactly what they've said. But um, as of the end of March, as of just before Easter, we did get some headline uh, figures from Ipsos Mori on the responses so far. And I'm pleased to report that about 88% of responses, those people who clicked through onto the questionnaire, supported the vision of the plan. 73% supported the process that we've gone through to develop the plan and the content of the plan. And 81% of people who've responded support the plan in its current form. So I think that is a ringing endorsement of the work that all of the partnership board have done so far on the plan. Uh, all of your officers, all of your members bringing those sort of things forward as well. And I think we look forward to bringing back to you in June a formal report on the consultation process and how we would like to take that forward then to a final plan towards the end of the year. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, comment at the end. Mike's on its way to you. Thank you very much. I'm Samantha Dixon from Cheshire West and Chester Council. I'm also the chair of Growth Track 360, which is a cross border uh, rail task force lobbying for improved uh, services and investment in Wales as well as England the relationship between the two and I just wanted to say thank you very much for holding the consultation event in London now. Um, I think the fact that uh, you're going the extra mile is to be welcomed and I hope you're doing similarly in the Scottish uh, regions too. Thank you. Any further Just um, would welcome, apologies, I uh, ask for the patience of other members because obviously we're coming up to speed with a lot of this uh, stuff. But I just would be interested to know how work on the strategic plan is kind of progressing alongside the long term investment programme, which I think is committed to in the, the, business, uh, the business plan earlier. Because obviously that document possibly is as, if not more important than the strategic plan, because the strategic plan is a little high level words, but that, if that's going to give some prioritisation of projects, I think there's. <laughs> That's where it will become very, very uh, important to people around the table. So the question is, how does that get handled? You know, is that going to be consulted upon after the consultation on the plan, or you know, what what is the process for the long-term investment program? Because I think that if that's going to deliver the plan, then we, we really need to start debating that sooner rather than later. I would say. So thanks, Andy. So we'll. we'll We've already started thinking about how we're going to do that because they are in lockstep with each other because the, the long-term investment program is the what bit. The, lot, the, the plan is the why and the how we're going to do things. The, the, the long-term investment program is, is the what bit. Um, a lot of the long-term investment program draws up from the work being done on Northern Powerhouse Rail, being drawn works on the Rail North long-term rail strategy and the work on the development corridors that we're working on across the project board. So again, this board and its constituent members will have full visibility of that as it's built up. I'd like to bring to you, I think probably in the June meeting, an idea of what that long-term investment programme looks like in its format. It'll be more, I think be more um, uh, formal each recommendation in the first five years to discharge TFN's responsibility and then look in the next 10 years to set some objectives and outcomes that we wish to see from our transport networks working towards and looking for development funding and development money towards that. But I'll bring that to the board in June, I think, when we finish the consultation process so you have full visibility of that at all stages. But just then to be clear, what then is the process by which that will be agreed? Is it, is it agreed alongside the final plan? Yes. So, the, so that would mean at some point from June towards the end of this year, We'd have to agree the investment programme at the time that we agree the plan. I think um, that could be one option, or the other option is that the investment programme is a say, phased investment programme where there's more certainty over those first five years and less certainty over the next ten years. That is, that is the options I'll bring back to this board in June well, to discuss. I think it needs to be a bit clearer, to be honest, because you know that is a crucial. You know, and if if it comes in June and we're then meant to agree it within a couple of months alongside the plan, I mean. 
I don't know. I mean, it seems to me that look, that will require some debate, and yeah. you know, I think you know, we really need to be clear about the process for the investment program because I think that's where it will be difficult, but it's crucial to get that right. So clearly, all of these things can and should be. In Ian's next, and then Judah, all of these things can and should be revisited up to the point we finally publish. But it's been our intention to date that the strategic transport plan, when published as a final document, will have a strategic investment plan. But as Jonathan said, given it's a 30-year plan, we are firmer on proposals in the earlier stage than proposals in the later stage. And that is in part because more work will be needed, and in part that we don't want to lock ourselves in to technological solutions which are overtaken by innovation. Particularly one thinks of autonomous vehicles, the ongoing development of the sustainability debate as you move into the 2020s and 2030s, I'm sure however good our plan is, we will be seeking to revise it to take advantage of the opportunities that those issues raise. And that's the point I think Jonathan makes about the further you go into the plan, the more indicative it has to be, the more indicative it has to be, the less crystal clear we can be on cost and benefit. But we want, Andy, absolutely, comparing the points we made to the minister, to be as clear as we possibly can. So I think there will be two really important board meetings, June and September, when these things need full, transparent debate. Yes? Ian. Thank you. Uh, Ian Gillis, um, I'm the leader of the City of York. I also chair the East Coast Mainline Association, which is an amalgam of all the um, councils on these border in the East Coast Mainline from London right up and into Scotland. Um, a few weeks ago, there was a launch of an all parliamentary pol uh, political group to cover the East Coast Main Line. And I think you answered some of the points I was going to raise. Um, but what I'm concerned about is obviously we don't want duplication of the people working uh, as a, the East Coast Main Line and also on transport for the North. So will there be further consultation or uh, uh, exchange of ideas and, and, and uh, a wish list, if you like, uh, for the East Coast mainline part of uh, Transport for the North. So, so to answer that, Ian, one of our strategic development corridors is the East Coast to Scotland Rail Corridor, which marries the, that, that East Coast mainline that you talked about. Um, we at Transport for North are made up of our constituent partners. We rely on our constituent partners, so we are absolutely aligned with the work that the East Coast mainline authorities have been doing. And our work on that strategic development corridor isn't actually going to be a lot of external consultancy work because a lot of the work, as you said, has already been done and commissioned and we'll be using that work in making the case for investments on that corridor. Um, consultation is one of those things that you cannot assume because you've gone out with one round that you've done your job and um, I think we should have a very clear plan of how we keep communicating on an ongoing basis from um, bitter experience, you know, transport improvements are fine until they actually start to um, impact on people's local areas. And I think, you know, um, with the best in the world, I really commend you on what you've achieved in a very short time frame. But I think we need to be actually quite hard nosed and look at the consultation events. And I think it's probably fair to say that some were better attended and more successful than others. And I think we need to be quite honest about where it's worked well and where we could improve. And I think from from the conversations I've had, where there's been engagement with the local partners, such as local authorities, but particularly with the business community, those events have, have been more successful. Uh, we, you know, certainly in West Yorkshire, we've had some that were actually quite poorly attended. And, and obviously, weather, changing venues, etc., has had played a part in that. But I think we need to have the reassurance that we will keep going back out um, to consult as we move things forward because otherwise we're going to, uh, you know, we'll always be at risk of um, um, different constituencies saying that they haven't had the information that the Crown Power about it. I think that's right, Judith. I think that, that you know, there's been variable attendances and, and I think that you're right, the ones that have had the greatest attendance have been the ones where we've, we've worked very closely with local partners, but also there's something else happening or there's been some other event going on around it. So we had very good attendance at Doncaster Sheffield Airport when we did some work with them on their launch of their master plan. We're going to do an internal review of how the consultation process went uh, within, within TFN and we'll probably take a report on that to uh, our, our partners through our executive board. But I think you're absolutely right and part of this thing about 
planning now for the publication of the final plan towards the end of the year, starting that now is that we, we can get that communications plan right and keep that, that, that engagement going. The, the positivity, I think, is generally been when you say to people, do you want to improve transport across the world? Do you want to improve the economy? They go, yeah, great, get on with it. And I think they come back to Andy's point about the investment programme will be the key thing. So understanding what that looks like and how we're going to communicate that both to government but also to the wider public, I think, is really important. So we'll pick that up in the report. We'll bring back to yourselves in June, if that's okay. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, well, I, I agree absolutely with the points that have been made. I think that... Um, when the investment plan is presented, that will be critical for those communities that will benefit from that investment plan as much as it will be the message that it sends to those that won't and the phasing in which that um, will be impacted on. So I think I absolutely agree with the point that's been made around how we continue communication and consultation on the plan. But also I think we as members need to have a broader understanding about what goes behind some of that investment decision. It can't just be about coming here and making a decision on it we've got to understand the background and the rhetoric that goes with that because that was the point I was making to the Minister. Clearly we want to pitch uh, projects comparably to get the best for our area but we also need to understand that the business cases attached to each of those are credible and they've gone through an exhaustive process that we can back them wholeheartedly and say that these are the best and the most credible schemes that will secure funding. Thank you. And, and I think just emphasising that and, and looking to the sort of left-hand side of the table, what, again, one of the things that, that we found really good in, in the consultation process was the engagement of businesses, and particularly the private sector businesses who said, this is what this will unlock, this is what this type of investment will unlock to us. And I, I think that will be important for us in that communication to government and the final plan as to having businesses standing behind this to say, this is what it will achieve. This is the difference it will make to people's lives. Because if there was one criticism we kept getting back was that it all sounds great, but what does it really mean to me? And I think there's, there's, there's a bit of work for us to do to humanise the plan, to make, make it clear to people what it really means, transforming opportunities, you know, growth, education, you know, the health agenda, inactive travel, how it supports our local authorities. And I think that there's a real bit we can do to bring forward that, that in the plan and, and make it live. Go to this side of the table. Yeah, uh, Mark Willington, I'm uh, from Staffordshire, we're the co-opted side of it. Uh, I'm also uh, Vice Chair and we alternate between Chair and Vice Chair on West Midlands Rail. Uh, and, and the point really for me is that, that what you've created today is quite a vast animal and it's going to be difficult for you within the whole of the north of England uh, to make it work and, and it's, uh, I applaud you for, for, for trying. Um, but what we need to do is make sure that, that, that the uh, Midlands engine and transport for the north and, uh, and anything that goes on between the two powerhouses effectively um, uh, meshes together, particularly with the, with the onset of HS2 because it's, going, it's coming to crew uh, in eight years' time. Um, and we need to make sure that, that, that the linkage is north, south, east and west are right. So, so it is important and I... And I um, I thank you for, for being allowed to be at the table to, to discuss. And then Chris, I think, you've had your hand up. Chris Astrid. <coughs> I'd like to endorse what Judith said about it. I went to do these consultations. I have to say I was pretty disappointed by the engagement at the local level of what we've done. A lot of work has gone into it. I think this is a fundamental problem, not just with, with this organisation, but other organisations. We think we are getting through, I don't think we are getting through to the people who matter, whether it is business people, my experience, business people are not engaging in such they should do, and the public is not engaged. Now, how much of that lies with us to deal with, and how much of it is a, a fundamental problem right across the north, but I think it is a serious problem. But the gap between what we want to happen and what people feel should happen. That point's well made, Chris, and built on Judith's earlier point, and you've both made these points at previous board meetings. Um, we will learn from the experiences of this public consultation um, because it's a rich um, menu of experiences, but I'm very, very clear that, um, thinking of the Commonwealth Games on the other side of the planet, the bar has been risen today. The bar for us to speak to constituents and passengers and citizens across the north as a statutory body working as servants of them on their behalf is a higher bar and we have got to redouble our efforts
to make sure we engage effectively. Um, and we will do that. That's a commitment. We have an excellent um, um, stakeholder engagement and communications team led by Claire Kraken in the, in the organisation. And I know, Barry, this is something we're going to look at again to see what more we can do to reach people with messages that are accessible and meaningful. Okay, are we done on that item for now? This will come back big time in June. So I need you to endorse the draft strategic plan that we published in January, otherwise we've got an awful lot of pulping to do. Um, so can I have your endorsement for the report we've already published? I'm not being flippant, that's an important matter of determination. And do you note and accept the um, uh, consultation update with the very important contributions that board members have made, which is really marking our card for what we bring back to you in June. But again, Jonathan, an awful lot of people have slogged up and down the country to uh, do these events and uh, grateful to all members of the team, particularly some of the more junior members of the team who have a lot of the grunt work to do that make these things work well. So thank you very much. Okay, we're nearly there, folks. We're moving on. There is an important item 12, which is another of these statutory items. We've had a very important organisation, which was in many ways the predecessor of Transport for the North, which was Rail North. We are building on the success of Rail North. And to do that, we need to transfer Rail North formally in with its own agreement into the organisation. And Deborah Dimmock, one of our legal team, will take us through what needs to be done. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, it was one of the fundamental principles of the submission proposal that the business of uh, Rail North Limited in managing on behalf of the Secretary of State the rail franchises of Trans Pennine Express and Northern Rail be brought, be brought uh, closely aligned to the business of Transport for the North. And uh, the purpose of this report is for members to approve in principle the transfer of the business of Rail North Limited, uh, the business, the assets and the liabilities of Rail North Limited to Transport for the North and for Transport for the North to subsume the business of Rail North going forward. And so that will be affected through three uh, major agreements. First of all, the Rail North Partnership Innovation and Variation Agreement, which this, uh, the Minister has signed earlier today. The Rail North Business Transfer Agreement, which will transfer the assets and liabilities in the Rail North Franchise Management Agreement. At the same time, there will be a hosting agreement to continue the existing arrangements with the hosting agreement as well. Thank you very much, Deborah. I think this is self-explanatory. It builds on a very successful operation by Rail North. We're very grateful to all those involved in the running of Rail North, Leah, you and your team. And uh, we will keep that work going under this wider family banner. Does this transfer and me signing the various partnership agreements meet with your support? Thank you. Any objections? Thank you very much indeed. Now, we have met uh, in public, open and accessibly on all of these items. The final item on our agenda is one that we feel it is appropriate, is an exemption from that openness. It is simply because it's about HR practices within Transport for the North and relates to issues of salaries and pensions. Um, and those matters are clearly confidential to the individuals concerned, but have some governance issues. So I am proposing in item 13 that we use the powers of the Local Government Act to exclude item 14 from open session. And I've given the reasons for it. It's the personal confidentiality of the information considered in item 14. So I need a vote of support, if you do support it, that item 14 be held in private. Do I have vote of support. Can I have hands up from statutory members? Does anybody object to that item being held in private? Thank you. So that brings us then to the close of the public meeting. I want to thank members of the public who have attended. I hope you found it of interest and look forward to seeing you in Manchester on a sunny day on the Thursday the 28th 
of June. Thank you very much. If board members could